everybody, and uh, today we're going to talk about powerful bishops and the idea called windmill, the tactical idea of windmills. So, first and foremost, I want to warm up with a small puzzle between Tony Miles and Walter Brown. Can anyone tell me who Tony Miles is? Does anyone remember? No. So, Tony Miles was one of the greatest British players, one, one of the greatest British player of all time until Short and Adams came by, and now we have Gavain Jones. And um, Tony Miles was a real eccentric. He even played on a massage table once while drinking milk. It's important that he wasn't drinking milk. So, apart from being a chess eccentric, he was a really imaginative attacking player. And let's try to solve this puzzle that actually Miles executed and won against Brown, Walter Brown, who was the American, who was an American chess, wait. He played for America? Not sure. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So he was American champion, as far as I know, yes. So it's six times champion, thank you. So Walter Brown, who was six times champion. Um, Tony Miles to move and play a splendid sacrifice. Yes. King takes h7, king takes h7, queen h5, king g8. So let's go back a little bit. Obviously, White will try to clear up the root for the rook so the rook can give checkmate. So indeed, bishop takes h7 is the first move. King takes, queen h5, king g8. And how should we continue this attack? Bishop takes g7, yes. So. This is a brilliant, brilliant sacrifice by Tony Miles. This is a double bishop sacrifice, which is kind of rare in modern chess. But if you look back in chess uh, history, this was seen before, but it's still nonetheless spectacular. So the black king takes g7. And now we need to try to box in the black king so we can give a beautiful mate for black. Yes? Queen G5. Yeah, queen g5. King h8. Rook c3. But that falls into one little trouble, that the bishop will go to e4, and just in the nick of time will help. And when we would give a check, the bishop is just there to cover up. So we don't want to give black some helping hand, yeah? No, but it is a queen move. Queen h6 is almost the move, but there's a more precise one. Yes? Yes. King g8. Can someone explain to me why queen f6 is such a brilliant idea? Yes? Rook c3. Okay, obviously there's two possible moves either rook c3 or rook c4. And I always do this, but I'm going to do it again. Let's vote. Should we play rook c3 or rook c4? And then I want two volunteers for both saying why this, and then the other side, why that? Yes? We should play rook c4. OK. So let's vote. Who says rook c4? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I cannot count. So many. Yes, why rook c4 and not rook c3? Mm -hmm. So if rook c4 you're saying we're cutting off any defensive ideas for black, right? Mm -hmm. Who says rook c3? Nobody. Good, good class. So if we would play rook c3, then he would play what? What is the defensive idea for black? Yes. Yes, and the bishop saves the day yet again. 
Because even though we would check the bishop covers, then if rook h3, if rook h3, then bishop h7 covers mate again and no mate. And that's sad. So which one was the move then? Rook c4, yes. And no more bishop e4 trickery. And this is way, way easier than rook c3. So the next move is going to be rook g4 and it mates. So we've learned that the bishop there, the bishop is a good sweeper. And the, bishop, the bishops can attack from afar. Then now comes the idea of windmills. Can anyone tell me what is a windmill tactic? Yes. Yes. And uh, yeah, basically you said that uh, you keep on checking and uh, taking huge amounts of material. And what, of, what do we do with this? Uh, sorry. Uh, which pieces we use for windmill? Yes? No? Yes? Yes? What did you say? Rooks and bishops, indeed. I heard different variations, but windmill is usually uh, used, wind, windmill tactics, it's windmill tactics, and it's rooks and bishops. Basically giving checks, multiple checks, and winning lots of material. But I'm going to give an example so you can see and prove, prove me how we could use the windmill tactic. So in this position, this is actually the first classical example of windmill tactics. Here, Lasker, who's one of those chess legends who Fisher used to recall all the time, is actually losing to a Mexican legend called Tori Repetto, who actually has a, a Tori memorial annually at Mexico. So here, it might seem that we are pinned and that we cannot move the bishop because if the bishop moves, then they'll take our queen. But is that true? Can we use the windmill for the first time in history? Yes. Um, bishop h6. Bishop h6. That doesn't work at the moment because the idea is good, but then they take, rook takes, I guess. And king h8, and we cannot continue giving checks. Yes? Yes. Bishop f6. This was the brilliant idea of Torre. And now black takes, takes. And now somebody, please, let's start giving windmill checks. Yes. Yeah, you. Rook takes f7, check, king g8. Yes? Yeah, king h8. Yes? Yes, rook takes b7, king g8. How can we continue our annual windmill? Yes? Yes? King h8. And I think it's about high time we win more material. Uh, okay, someone is saying that we should win more piece. How can we win some more piece? Yeah? Rook takes a7. Rook takes a7. A7. Greedy, greedy. King g8. Yes? Rook g7 and then g5. Rook g5. And... Basically, Torre took everything possible on the seventh rank. Like, and now we take the queen, yes. And that's how Torre beat Lasker. So it's a valuable idea to know how... It's a valuable idea. It's a valuable idea to know how windmills work. Therefore, I came up with three studies of my own on windmills. Uh, it's not a super famous study because I just did it a few weeks ago. 
So this is the super famous one, not yet known, but it's going to be super famous. This is, I'm going, I made three types of puzzles. They will look really similar, but the solution is different all the time. I did some work, okay? Um, it's my to move and win with windmill ideas. Yes. Me? No. Uh, you. Yes. Bishop F6. Bishop F6. That wins, but not with a windmill idea. Yes? H6. What? Queen H6. Queen H6, yes. I was about G takes H6. G takes F6. Yes, King G7. No. King H7. Excuse me. 7. King H8. And now we're reaching the critical moments when we will need to know where we want to take material or mating. For some reason, I'm voting for mating. Maybe I know the solution. Uh, yeah? Yes, check again. King G8. Rook C7. That's a little bit early because why does Rook C7, why doesn't Rook, take, rook takes C7 work? Yes? Yeah, 96 just blocks. So we need to make a precise move before we could take on c7. Yes. Me? Yes. Oh, rook. What? Rook yeah, rook g7 check. King, king h8. And now, yes? Um. And rook takes c7 <coughs> is? Mate, surprisingly. It's very unusual to see the white rook blocking the seventh rank and therefore giving checkmate with two bishops. So, yes, the rook. So, remember this position because this will be useful for the last study. So, let's now move on to study number two, which is a little different. Therefore, the solution will change a little bit. Queen H6. How did you find queen h6? I don't even know. G takes h6. Bishop takes f6. King h7. Well, obviously, well, obviously the first moves are simple because we're practicing the windmill idea. But, but, shh, shh, but we have to... We have to find a key solution to actually find mate in this position. The first moves were easy, but often the second, third moves are the critical ones. And usually the, these are silent moves. Yes, uh, it, the silent move is basically a move which is not forcing, not giving a check, but sets up a great tactical idea or sets up a mating threat. So. So, rook g7, rook g7 check, obviously, king h8. And now, there's a brilliant idea, yes? Yeah, it's white to move. I n you didn't raise it? Yes? What did you say? Rook f7, no. Who says e5? Raise your hand if you think e5 is the winning move. One, two, a three, a four, a five, six. E5, yes. E5 is the silent deadly move. Even though, what if, what if black gives a check? What if they check us? We didn't expect that, did we? Yes? Yeah, but surprisingly, we defend with a mating move. You don't see that all the time. It's pretty amazing to see a mating defensive move. That's how strong windmills are. This is the third study and final study. Wait. Black 
obviously is cramped, so he decides to take on C3. Now fireworks start. Queen H6, G6, Bishop takes F6 here. Obviously this is the kind of like to be a position of the windmill, but we can use our rook to full effect to close in the black queen. So we might want to position our rook at a place where it will close, cl where it will close that queen from hitting our king. So what should our next move be? Yes. Yes? Rook g7. Rook g7. King h8. Yes? Yeah, rook takes f7. King g8. Yes? Yes, king h8. And how do you continue? Rook a7. That actually doesn't block the queen. Because this queen is putting annoying pressure on our pawns. We want to stop that. Yes? Yes, rook b7. King g8. And now, as the queen is block blocked, we can give an even more powerful check. Yes. Yes, bishop b3. Now that we block the queen from protecting the d5 square, we can give a check with the bishop. So if black plays bishop f7, how will he get mated? Yes. Yes, king h7. Yeah, continue. G6, yeah, king g8. Yes. 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 I'm listening. Yes. Uh, anyone else sees mate in few moves? Yes? Rook g7, king h8. Um, rook, uh, h4. Yeah, king g8. And then rook h8. So we can see that the rook is a tireless worker in this game as it gives millions of checks and in the end mates. So that's what happens if bishop f7 is played. So d5. Bishop takes d5, knight e6, now rook g7 is played, king f8, and now comes a brilliant move, a silent brilliant move that actually will mate black. The white bishop takes the queen, but then the g7 rook is not well defended enough and we lose it. Yes, yes, back there. Oh, I thought you raised your hand? Yes. Exactly. Brilliant idea. What would be your next move with white? No? What would be white's next move? Yes. So it is a brilliant idea found. Congrats for finding it. Actually, after it's lost for black now. Surprisingly, Black is a queen up, but he's totally lost. If black plays queen d8, there's mate in two, I tell you. It's mate in two in this position. How, could, how should white continue? Yes? Seven? Queen takes c7? Yes. Bishop takes queen? No, not. Yes? Yes? What? what? Rook g8 mate. Yeah, rook g8 mate. So, surprisingly, and there's no way that black can stop mate, even though it's just the power of two bishops, a rook, and a pawn. So, the bishop? Okay. What should white play if black takes? Yes, the bishop. e7 still mates. And if black pays. 
Rook A7. He's still trying. He's still trying to survive, but this will fail because of yes. You raise yes. Yes, rook e7. And rook g8. So black, in this hopeless situation, gives away the bishop. But we're not scared. We're taking the bishop. Um, if black would play king e8, how would king e8 lose? It's, again, a silent winning move. <coughs> yes. Rook h7. And surprisingly, there's no way to parry rook h8 mate. So the sad king has to go the other way. And now, we give a check, king h8, rook c7, king g8, and it obviously will not take a draw because we have beautiful bishops in the center, a dominating rook, and how can we win this game with a pawn promotion? Yes? e7 check, black needs to take. Yeah, and queens or rook, but queen is kind of nicer, and white wins the game with the windmill idea. Thank you so much for paying attention and learning about windmills. Thank you.